stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Many of my listeners and clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday. What they have in common can be a low level of dissatisfaction in their lives. And no matter how much they tell themselves they shouldn't be dissatisfied for whatever reasons, that dissatisfaction isn't going away unless they make a change. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shape their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into that dissatisfaction, and also where their strengths lie, where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that might be limiting their success, and discovering how to shift those stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. This week's episode of Your Stories Don't Define You is part two of a series I'm exploring. Last week, I shared what it's like to have command in my top talents using the StrengthsFinder assessment. This week, I'm sharing about what my top two talents, strategic and activator, look like for me. And next week, I'll round out my top five, sharing stories of how these talents combined with ideation and adaptability show up in my life for better and for worse. As a Gallup Certified StrengthsFinder coach, I've taken opportunities to work with other coaches myself for two reasons. One is that I believe in this. The idea that when we understand our own way of thinking, our natural instinctive talents, and when we understand where we might be getting in our own way, we find more satisfaction in our lives. Another reason is that to be a coach and to have a coach demonstrates my belief to my clients that this works, that working with a good coach adds value. I know that the more I know about my own talents and blind spots, the more effective I can be for my clients. As I mentioned, today you'll hear how my top two strengths, strategic and activator, show up in my daily life and some strategies I now use to make sure they're working for me and not against me. When I saw the word strategic on the strengths report as my number one talent, I laughed out loud. I'm not strategic. This is so far off. This is one of those reasons I don't like these personality assessments. But because it was a dear friend, Tom Dietzler, who gave me this gift, I decided to look at my results in a different way. I sent the description of strategic as it was written in my report to my sister and my husband, the two people I believe know me sometimes better than I know myself. And I did not include the word strategic in the message. I asked, what do you think of this? Do you think it describes me? I didn't want to influence their answers, so I did my best to ask without a hint of how ridiculous I thought it was. But my sister responded almost immediately, wow, Sarah, they sure have your number. That's exactly you. I immediately called her. I had to ask her for specific examples, stories of times when she thought that description showed up. She had lots of examples, and so did my husband. That's when I invested in a StrengthsFinder coach. I had to find out more about this talent that I couldn't see in myself. She called me Speedy Gonzalez. My first coach, after becoming a Gallup Certified StrengthsFinder coach, had a gorgeous Barcelonan accent, and she said, Sarah, you're like Speedy Gonzalez. Imagine you notice the village is running low on cheese, so you take money from the village coffer, run fast, as you do, to a nearby village buy cheese, and run back. Problem solved. Except that when you return, you hear the villagers having a discussion about what kind of cheese to get this time, or maybe they won't get cheese at all. Maybe it'll be salami instead. But you've already solved the problem, right? (laughs) I am such a visual person. I immediately imagined the tiny mouse running like a blur to the next village and running back carrying a huge block of cheese over his head just like in the cartoons. And just like that, I had a deep insight into how I sometimes get in my own way. 
my strategic brain immediately comes up with a solution to a problem or a puzzle. Many times it comes so fast that I'm not even sure I thought about it. The solution simply popped into my head. And because my strategic is immediately followed by activator, I just go. I take the first step and I know I'll deal with the obstacles or consequences as I meet them or hit them face first. Most of the time, this way of thinking is awesome. It guides me to the fastest, simplest solutions to complex problems. I make decisions quickly, and the majority of the time, they have been excellent decisions. When I worked as a PeopleSoft consultant with federal agencies in the D.C. area, those skills are what made me successful in identifying solutions for the help desk, creating easy-to-understand training materials, and finding solutions to implementation issues around data collection. But for most of my life, I considered myself impulsive because I didn't realize my brain was actually coming to the solution before I could fully process what that meant. The map is in my head and I'm taking the first step. And I don't always take stakeholders on the ride with me, causing communication issues and sometimes the appearance that I'm impulsive. Here's an example. When I get into the car to run more than one errand, before I even plug my seatbelt in, I have the route in my head. Not because I'm a planner or because I think about it with intention, but because that's how my brain works. The route is specific. Many things taken into account, like not wanting to turn left across the traffic on a busy street, not wanting to backtrack, but wanting an efficient route and knowing the grocery store has to be the last stop because it's 80 degrees outside and I'll have frozen peas in my car. It wasn't until a few months after my first conversation with a coach that I came to this realization. And years later, I continue to see where my strategic shows up in my daily activities. What's especially interesting to me is that many people struggle in seeing that first number one talent as a talent or even as something that truly describes them. Here's why. Those top two talents are so natural, so innate, that we can't even see how they're unique or special. I can tell when I've identified a true talent in a client, when I ask them to tell me about the most common compliment they receive. And then they tell me, but they qualify it, saying something like, but everyone does that, or they ask. Doesn't everyone do that? They dismiss the compliment because the skill or talent comes too easily for them. They can't own it because it wasn't hard to get good at it. It wasn't a struggle. When you think about it, isn't that kind of silly? Here's another way I know I've uncovered something special in a client. When I ask them about how they feel when other people don't think in the natural way that they do. Like when my husband drives on our errands and I have to bite my tongue because he doesn't seem to have a route in his head. It feels like each turn he takes is an assault on my brain. I get annoyed, I'll admit it. And I used to think, how is this possible? He's the smartest guy I know. Why would he turn left here? Now he's going to have to cross a, a lot of traffic on the busiest street in town to go left. I worked with a coach to better understand my talents and how to apply them with intention. It also helped me know which talent to employ at different times and how. So when I get annoyed because someone isn't doing something the way I would do it, I use my ideation, which is my number three talent. It magically comes up with ideas all the time. I use that ideation to focus my brain on curiosity about the situation. I begin to ask myself questions like, why am I getting prickly and annoyed? What's triggering this? Does it matter right now if he takes a different route? Am I in a hurry? And when I've answered those questions, I may choose to ask my husband, what's your plan for our errands? What are you thinking about for our shopping list? I do this at work with my children, and even when I'm driving behind someone who seems to be lost. My drivers are strategic and activator. 
neither of which are in the relationship building domain of the four strengths finder domains. And that alone is a clue about where my motivation is, which is mostly task-based, not people-based. And now that I know that, my communication has shifted. I'm using those talents with far more intention, and my relationships and leadership have improved dramatically. The only way we grow as humans, the only way we can truly find satisfaction in our relationships is to be self-reflective. This is not the same as being hypercritical of ourselves. Being self-reflective means understanding our role in every situation and in every relationship. Asking ourselves questions like, what am I doing to move this conversation in a positive direction? What was my role in that conflict? What natural talents am I using in ways that are positive? And where am I getting in my own way? If you enjoyed this podcast brief, stay tuned for next week's episode when we'll explore my ideation and adaptability to round out my top five talents. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places, and the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, the audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review and let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you.